Now Mercedes had returned. Rodney Walkerley, Grand Vitesse of the motor, reported the reappearance of the silver cars in a single famous line. June 54. At the frontier, a convoy of German trucks is cleared to drive across France for Reims and the French Grand Prix. Now, the population of France had become used to German lorries passing in the night. For had not the same thing happened 20 years ago, almost to the day? Then, the destination of the convoy had also been the French Grand Prix, but at Montlhéry, and as at Reims, it was the first appearance of a German team after a war. The new cars amazed the 1934 crowds. What was to delight the crowds even more was that the German wonder cars were to be defeated by an Alfa Romeo driven by the Frenchman Louis Chiron. While they were still in the running, the German cars looked and sounded most impressive and would become unbeatable. In 1954, at Reims, the new German cars created a similar sensation, again impressing the knowledgeable French. Fangio was the team's principal driver with Carl Kling. Special streamlined bodies had been built for fast circuits like Reims. From the fall of the flag, Fangio, world champion, leads the race with his teammate Kling close behind, watched by Hermann Lang, a pre-war Mercedes driver. The straight eight Mercedes engines sounded crisp and powerful, and the new cars handled well. The rest of the field, which included world-class drivers and Ferraris and Maseratis, were left cold. Well, they are back, though the applause was muted. Any Frenchman over the age of 10 at Reims that day had lived under German occupation. The memory remained green. But Fangio and Kling had given Mercedes a most convincing comeback. Ten years earlier, Daimler-Benz at Stuttgart was rubble. But the company soon made its contribution to the German economic miracle of the 50s. And production was soon booming to meet the insatiable demand for new cars at home and abroad. So much so, the technical director of the pre-war racing department, Rudolf Ullenhout, was informed by the management that... It would be good to have some sort of competition car so that people realise Mercedes Benz was still there. And he just said, we've got to do something. He didn't say what, he didn't say much, how much money we would get. So we took components from a normal passenger car which we were building. We took the engine, we took the gearbox, we took the front axle and the rear axles. So really it was quite a normal car. But we built a new frame and a new body. And this car was quite successful. The car was the famed Gullwing 300S, which was second in the Mille Emilia and had won an important sports car race in Mexico, which not unnaturally pleased the Mercedes management. Yes, they were a bit too pleased, I believe, because then they took the decision to build a racing car. Once the decision had been taken, the whole resource of Daimler-Benz was at the disposal of the racing department. Ullenhout considered that a scaled-up version of the one-and-a-half-litre V8, which had defeated the Alphas at Tripoli in 1939, would be the best engine to build. The research department disagreed, arguing that a straight eight would be lighter, and if the drive were taken from the midpoint of the long crankshaft, the usual torsional vibration of a straight eight would be overcome. However, when the prototype first ran... The engine had terrific torsional vibration, so we had to put a torsional vibration damper on both ends, which eliminated the advantage of lighter weight. But it was uh, designed that way, we had to take it. If the straight eight was a little conservative, the decision taken to use fuel injection was, at the time, a radical departure for the car engine. During the Second World War, the Germans had taken a lead in the techniques of fuel injection, which was used in their aircraft. The system was direct, 
a timed and metered quantity of fuel had to be injected into each cylinder under high pressure. Unlike today's injection, in which the fuel, controlled by electronics, is sprayed at low pressure into the intake manifold. Their wartime system was entirely mechanical and relied on precision engineering of the highest order to meter the atomized fuel, from injectors able to withstand the very high temperatures and pressures inside each cylinder. The technique was difficult enough when applied to an aircraft engine of some 36 litres. When adapting it to a car engine, the total capacity of which was less than a single cylinder of the aircraft engine, it became an exercise of the utmost severity. But it was done. Test engines were soon running on the bench. From the pump, the high-pressure fuel pipes lead to each individual cylinder, injecting the correct quantity of fuel at the precise time giving a 10% increase in power. The injectors look remarkably similar to the wartime version. Vital though the engine of a Grand Prix car undoubtedly is, the chassis does more than keep the wheels apart. The frame of the W196 was a superb design. Gas welded from thin steel tubing, it was light yet strong and rigid, essential for good handling. In general, the Germans tend only to trust techniques which they themselves have innovated or developed. Although British disc brakes had been successfully used by Connaught and Jaguar, for the W196, inboard drum brakes were used, which required drive shafts. There was an intriguing reason for this apparent complication. We thought we might eventually use four-wheel drive. And there it was better to have the brakes inside because you had to have the differential drive anyway. We first of all considered what wasn't perfect on our 39 racing cars. They had a De Dion axle which had a tendency to judder on bad and bumpy roads. So we said we've got to do something in that. Then we said as our normal production cars had swing axles, we can't use a different axle. It's got to be some type of swing axle, as it wouldn't be good propaganda. But to cope with very much higher cornering speeds and stresses encountered in racing, a new version of the swing axle was produced for racing cars. Ullenhout demonstrates. It was to prove satisfactory and was later modified for production road cars. Behind closed doors in 1953, the first of the new cars were completed. When the W196 was revealed, it was clearly an advance on any possible rival. It was, of course, built to the highest standards, without regard to commercial considerations. It is true that the cars lacked the lines of Italian designs, but they possessed an air of efficient menace. The fuel and oil tanks were conventionally placed over the rear axle. The engine was canted to 70 degrees to lower the body line. Full fuel injection was used, and the valves were mechanically operated without the use of springs. The triangulated steel space frame was made from straight tubing. A five-speed gearbox transmitted 270 horsepower at 8,500 RPM. It had been said that the W196 was not a particularly advanced design for 1954. But the whole would prove greater than the sum of the parts. For 1954, two versions of the car would be raced, the open-wheeled and the streamlined car. Bodywork apart, the two cars were mechanically identical. The drivers preferred the open car. It could be more accurately placed on fast corners. At the British Grand Prix, Gonzalez leads. Even Fangio found the streamlined car difficult to place on the Silverstone corners, marked only by tubs, which he hit, as the front of the car testifies. Fangio had set the fastest lap in practice, but had to settle for fourth place. It was to be Ferrari's day, Hawthorne being second. And teammate Gonzalez won the 1954 British Grand Prix. But any thoughts of an Italian renaissance were premature, as the experienced head of the Mercedes equipe, Alfred Neubauer, knew. Fangio would win no fewer than four Grand Prix in 1954 for Mercedes. Before signing for the German team, he had won in the Argentine and at Spa on a 250F Maserati to become world champion for the third time. 
The Maserati seems elegant compared with the squat Mercedes. It was in the 50s every schoolboy's idea of a racing car. Powered by a classic six-cylinder double overhead camshaft engine of two and a half litres with individual water feeds to cool each exhaust valve. The Maserati was not fuel injected and therefore was less powerful than the Mercedes. John Watson test drives a 250F. I have a lot of respect for this particular car. I would think it's a kind of car that probably was best suited to the, the classic photograph of Fangio driving at Rouen in 1957. Coming down a sequence of very, very quick left and right-hand corners epitomizes what the 250F is all about. Judging it by the standards of the day, it was probably very competitive, but I think the car is ideally suited to the very fast open corners of faster tracks. But it was neither quite the definitive front-engine car, but it was probably slightly in advance of its contemporaries. The 250Fs were successful but never managed to beat the Mercedes. Why? I think that they suffered from being Italian. If Maserati brothers happened to be born in Stuttgart, no doubt this car would not be red, it would be silver, and it would have been winning Grand Prix. I think the difference that we're seeing in the program between you know, the Maserati here and Mercedes and other cars of that period is the, the difference in the attitude of and the, sort of the mentality of the, the countries. In Germany, they took a design which, in many respects, was a very pre-war design, but they incorporated certain innovations, certainly with the fuel injection, and they made it work, they made it powerful, and they made it reliable. What but they, the they maybe didn't have quite that sort of engineering flair that Italian engineers do seem to have. 32 250Fs were built, most of which were available for sale to independent drivers. Sterling Moss had acquired one for a specific purpose. My father and my manager, Ken Gregory, had gone to see Neubauer at the end of 53 when they heard the new Mercedes were coming out. And Neubauer said to them, look, we think Sterling has great talent, so we've seen him do very well in a, in a pretty mediocre car. We'd like to know how well he'd go in a decent car. We suggest you get buy a car like a Mazda, which we did. And I happened to get fastest lap in the Swiss Grand Prix at Bern in front of the Mercedes team. And I think that was what clinched my arrangement. And Neubauer asked me to go and try the W196 at Hockenheim. And uh, I had most impressive. I mean, I went there, and this is in the middle of nowhere. And I drove the thing. I came in with a black face. You may remember they had inboard brakes, and you've got the dust. I had a black face, and I got a bit of rag. And I'm going like this. And the mechanic came up, and he clicked his heels. And there he got a bowl of hot water with soap in his hand and a towel. And I thought, this is in the middle of nowhere. This guy had got hot water. I thought, this is really impressive. Monaco, 1955, was Sterling's first European race as a member of the Mercedes team, a point the newsreel missed. Sterling Moss was there, of course. Here's Maurice Trantignon of France and veteran driver Taruffi of Italy. Now Louis Chiron and finally Kling of Germany. Prince Renier was a spectator during the race itself, the 13th European Grand Prix with 20 competitors taking part. Mercedes had built special short wheelbase cars for the sinuous Monaco circuit. The circuit at fantastic speeds. This course is about the most treacherous in the world with its narrow streets and hairpin bends. Number two, Fangio held the lead in a Mercedes for the early part of the race, but he was later overtaken by Sterling Moss, number six, driving another Mercedes. Unfortunately, it wasn't Sterling's day. He had to retire later with a fractured oil pipe. This sensational Grand Prix, having averaged 65.8 miles an hour in a Ferrari, Trantignon won a cup worthy of his performance. Win or lose, the Mercedes team was run with military precision by Alfred Neubauer. An ex-driver, he had been the company's racing manager since 1934, and as Sterling Moss soon discovered, was held in high regard by the whole team. There was an enormous amount of respect. The respect of Neubauer as the team manager, I mean, a fantastic character and a man who thought very much of his drivers and would keep people away to try and make things easy for them. He'd always get us the quiet rooms if he could. And he knew the personalities and the, and the habits of the drivers and he would 
set things up that way. I mean, in other words, Fangio didn't like to get up very early. Kling was German, he didn't mind. So Kling would be called out for an early morning test, and then it would be, next would be Hans Hermann, maybe, and then myself, and then Fangio. And little things like that. It was a very human team. Uhlenhout used to drive the cars, didn't he? Uhlenhout, of course, was English, uh, English mother, and a terrific driver. I mean, a great engineer, but there was a man, if you came in and said, listen, this doesn't handle too well, he'd get out there and prove that it did. And if it didn't, he would he would have the knowledge to be able to, to sort it out. Three Mercedes were entered for the 1955 Belgian Grand Prix, but only a lone Lancia D50, an exciting car which was, in many ways, in advance of the Mercedes, with pannier fuel tanks and offset V8 engine of 260 horsepower. Vittorio Giano was the designer. His was the lightest Formula One car yet built. Other cars were being rebuilt to the delight of small boys. It was common practice for teams to hire local garages to prepare the cars and then drive them to the circuit. Maseratis and Ferraris formed the main opposition to the Mercedes. Number 12 is Kling's car, Fangio and Moss being the other drivers. The 1955 Grand Prix at Spa was to be the last race before motor racing was to be changed forever. Before package tours cheapened European travel, the old money enjoyed the cosmopolitan atmosphere of the Grand Prix circuits that was virtually unchanged from pre-war days. The drivers, too, were old friends who competed mainly for the enjoyment of the sport. Amateur or professional, there was, in 1955, still little distinction between gentlemen and players. Some of us raced for fun, and I consider we were amateurs even though we were paid, whereas you've got professionals who race for the profession as their business. Amateur or professional, they faced 316 miles on one of the fastest circuits in Europe. Fangio leads, but Castellotti's Lancia has out-accelerated Moss, whose relaxed style was pioneered by the veteran Italian driver, Farina. I saw Farina racing, I think it was probably in Bari, and I remember his straight arm, and I thought, boy, that man does look, he looks so cool and relaxed. And I thought, half the thing, when you're racing neck and neck with other men, is if they think you're really relaxed and cool, they don't know how hard you're trying. And I thought, well, that does make sense, because if they think I'm gritting on and, and I'm right on the edge, then it's not too difficult to think, well, I'll try and pass the man. So I sort of worked on that and honed that thing out till hopefully my competitors all thought that, you know, my head back a bit. My head was back a bit, I think, actually, because then I could peer over things. Moss may have appeared relaxed, but the Mercedes needed careful handling. I'm surprised really that the Merc wasn't a little bit easier to drive, because it wasn't. Oh, it was a driver's car, but not an easy car to drive. The Mercedes team was strictly controlled with visual signals from Neubauer in the pits. When we had 30 seconds ahead of the rest of the field, they put out REG, which meant regulari. But the other drivers weren't thinking of winning. They were trying to be the first non-Mercedes, which was a rather depressive attitude, really. Fangio and Moss are lapping at over 121 miles per hour. The pace is telling. Castellotti pushes the Lancia, its engine wrecked. A Maserati comes into the pits with a chronic misfire. The young driver, Luigi Musso, can only wait patiently. Even a Mercedes is in trouble. It is Carl Kling's, and it is losing oil from a fractured pipe. The engine is too badly damaged to continue. Is the team mortal, after all? Musso had been well placed, but his Maserati has damaged valve gear. He restarts, but is now two laps behind the leader, Fangio, with Sterling Moss, as ever, close behind. I would follow Fangio as close as I could. I mean, we were known, we were christened in one of the papers as being the train, because I'd be within a meter or so of him. Neubauer didn't like it. And he said, you know, if he makes a mistake, you're going to be caught up in it. I said, Fangio doesn't make mistakes. I mean, Fangio was, and I think still is, the greatest driver that's ever driven. Winning the 1955 Belgian Grand Prix, Moss being a few yards behind. The car Fangio drove to victory at Spa, chassis number eight, is preserved by Mercedes. John Watson drove it at Hockenheim, a course he knows well, but not from the cockpit of a front-engine car. 
It's strange to see corners so far away from the front wheels. That's my initial impression. I'm much more accustomed to being almost between the front wheels. Now I'm eight feet back, and it's quite different, quite a different feel. It's obviously a car from a period of motor racing where the size of the tyres limit very much the amount of grip that you do have. Though I believe that if uh, you took this car, for example, and fitted a modern wheel and tyre and, and altered the suspension to suit, that in fact the road holding would be of a very high order indeed. Tyres and brakes are the great advance in motor racing in the last 30 years. And certainly, if you're driving the car today, when I put my foot in the brake, I wonder when they're going to start working. I haven't been using maximum revs because it's a very valuable piece of equipment, but at the point where I was slipping off, it was really beginning to go, and it would be interesting to see what would happen if you were able to, in fact, run it up to its limit, which eventually, I believe, was about 9,000 RPM. So remember, you've got the engine in front of you, and I noticed just in the few laps I was driving the car that the heat from the engine and the gearbox, which is virtually between my legs, the heat soaking through, and with these overalls on, in those few laps, I felt quite warm. So three hours or three and a half hours around Monaco, I would have thought would have been pretty demanding of any driver. It's very difficult for a modern-day driver to equate with what drivers were doing 30-odd years ago. It's, it's an enormous difference between the modern-day car and this particular vehicle. I think the strength the company had in its engineering department, its R&D department, enabled the company to build racing cars that were, first of all, competitive. They were competitive. But I think that other cars were competitive at that period also. What they didn't have, and what the Mercedes does have, is this fantastic inbuilt strength and reliability. It could be punished all day and still be there at the end. Another end in sight was the carefree attitude to what was, and always had been, a dangerous sport. Straw bales would not contain cars doing 180, which were the speeds at Spa in 1955, with the spectators unprotected as on nearly all circuits. Until at Le Mans, 11th of June 1955, at precisely 1829, Pierre Levy crashed and his engine hurtled into a crowded enclosure. Levé and 82 spectators were killed, many others injured. The disaster was the worst in the history of motor racing and called the whole ethos of the sport into question. Well, 55 Le Mans did an enormous amount of damage, and obviously you can understand why. I mean, it stopped racing altogether, I think, in, in Switzerland, and, and a lot of other things were changed. Of course, there were demands were made, and I think quite correctly. Levé had been driving a Mercedes. The rest of the team was withdrawn. But the blazing wreckage signaled the end of Mercedes' motor racing commitment. One of the main reasons to stop was this terrific accident, which turned, at least in Germany, everything against racing. So he said, we've won everything. We don't go to race against public opinion. We'll stop. At a sad ceremony at Stuttgart, and the 1955 season closed, the W196 cars were retired, and the racing department, which had won nine Grand Prix in only two seasons, was disbanded. With the withdrawal of Mercedes, a vacuum was created which remained unfilled until the Monaco Grand Prix of 1957. Enzio Ferrari had fallen out with Fangio, and the world champion had left in a huff. Maserati's was still competing, but the Bologna firm was in deep financial trouble, and the 250Fs outmoded but Fangio would take one to his fifth championship. Here, Fangio is harried by a British car, a van wall. Van walls had been developed at enormous cost by the industrialist Tony van der Vel. It had a four-cylinder engine out of Norton by Rolls-Royce. The chassis was the work of the young Colin Chapman and the body by Frank Costa. But change was in the air and would lead to revolution. The revolutionary, John Cooper. But the instrument of his revolution was at that moment powered by an obscure Australian, Jack Brabham. Cooper had built 500cc Formula 3 cars. To get into Formula 1, Cooper only needed a competitive engine. He found one. It was used to power portable fire pumps. It was light and powerful. All it required was four wheels. 
It got them, and the ex-fire pump was to set the world of Grand Prix ablaze. Thank <laughs> you. 